This is my 52nd time to preach to you. I missed one. <laughs> no, I, I came just exactly one year ago, 52 weeks ago. And we have had a tremendous opportunity. If the Lord blesses and we have your correct email, you'll probably get a, a year-long testimony of what God has done to carry us over the last year. It should be a time when we just stand in awe of what God has accomplished here. Now, I know it's a long email, but it's been a long year. When I came to my year anniversary and I realized that God had done so many things and blessed us in so many ways, I wanted to do something, whether it's the first time you've walked in here, you're one of our visitors and guests, or whether you've been here for every one of the 51 long weeks of long messages, or whether it's somebody that's just come in recently and you don't really know what's actually happening here and you're kind of just learning about what Breakpoint is all about. I ask God, give me something to say to these people that come through that door that will be a blessing, that will help them to have a more joyful life that will give them hope in the midst of trials that can be very crushing or to give them insight into what you're doing that will give them a chance to breathe it in and go, wow, how cool is God's love? And so what he led me to was the message that I'm calling the pathway to contentment. How many of you would say right now you are content? Man, you are a rare group. I'll tell you that. More hands here than I expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You turn on the radio, you don't hear contentment. You turn on the television, you don't hear contentment. Um, when you turn on the news, however you happen to get your news, there is nobody ever going to get on there with a microphone and say, I have this breaking piece of information. There is a group back here in Overland Park, Kansas, that are really growing in their sense of contentment. <laughs> Pictures to follow. You know why? This is a churned up world. It's a very disturbed spirit in our community and in our country and in our world. If you don't recognize that there are things going on that are disturbing, frustrating, almost to the point of causing us to feel this little edge of anger, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So why would I be preaching to you about contentment? Because that's what God brings to those who love him. I don't care what you're going through or what the world situation is. If you are in harmony with God's will, you are content, even in the storm. I, I say that because, well, first of all, it's because it's true, but then the other half of it is, I, I was in Miami, Florida in 1992. Do you know what 1992 in the summer of 1992 was in the Dade County, Florida? We had a thing called Hurricane Andrew. Now, most people don't remember that too clearly now, but it's pretty well impressed on our memories because Hurricane Andrew came into Dade County, Florida as nearly a Category 5 hurricane and just blew us to pieces. 
Now, I knew it was coming, and I knew I'd never been in a hurricane on land. I was in a hurricane when I was in the Navy on the aircraft carrier, but uh, that's different. And I went to the church that morning, and I, I was hanging out there at the church, basically answering telephone calls and see if there was anybody who needed some extra help to get ready. The hurricane was supposed to hit about the time the dark hit that evening, the evening hit. And I was sitting around there, and the young lady from our youth group came over she to get something from the church. And she saw me sitting there, and she said, Pastor, what are you doing here? Nobody's coming to church this Sunday morning. Ain't nobody going to be in church Sunday morning. We're all out helping people get ready for the storm. I said, well, I've never been in a storm before. Don't really know what to do. She said, well, look, that house that you bought, it was an old HUD repossession thing, had plywood all over the windows when you bought it. Well, yeah. She said, do you still have that plywood? I said, yeah. She said, I'd suggest you put it back. <laughs> Good idea. Wise counsel. So I spent the whole day finding a way to get that plywood reattached onto that building over all the windows. And then just about dark, it started to blow real hard. But something interesting happened. As the storm began to blow and the transformers started to light up the sky with their great arcs of sparks and things as the wind started whipping things around, I went back in my bedroom and laid down in my bed and I slept all the way through the hurricane. First of all, I'm very good at sleeping. It's one of my gifts. <laughs> but the other thing is, I was completely contented. I had done everything a human being could ever do. There wasn't one thing left that I felt like had been neglected or somehow postponed or delayed or you know somehow beyond my ability. I had done everything I, I humanly could do. And I figured when we got done the next morning, we'd do whatever we have to do to cope with it when the storm was finished. So in the interim, I could rest. I want you to listen to this because Paul was in the middle of a storm as he wrote the book to the Philippians. He was in the middle of a chaos that he did not know what was going to end up as the final result. Because he was on his way toward his final trial. His life or death decision that was out of his hands, and he wrote this final letter to his friends at the church at Corinth, and here's what he had to say. This is Philippians 4, uh, 4 to 13. All right, let me just get this opened up here. Because we got several verses we're going to read out of Philippians. 4 to 13, and here's what he says. This is in the middle of a hurricane. So rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Oh, grab a hold of that. Underline that. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for what I have learned is to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned, quote, unquote, underline, the secret of being content in any and every situation. Better read that again. I'm sure I didn't get that right. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether to be well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, wait a minute. If I'm hungry, if I'm sick, if I'm feeling weak, how can I feel content? That's almost like an oxymoron, isn't it? To be in misery and being content? Well, I have a secret for you, the same secret that Paul had. If you have these elements in your life, you can be content. First of all, you have to be Christ-centered. Excuse me while I pick up my note. Christ-centered. And we're going to look at that in Philippians 3, verse 8 and following. Christ-centered. And here's what he writes. This is the way we be Christ-centered and faith-based. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that, that, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, to participate in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, if you are not, first of all, Christ-centered and faith-based, you're already missing the first and most important critical part of living in contentment. You haven't started down the pathway to contentment yet. That's okay. The pathway is there for all. But the first step that we take is saying, Lord, I'm going to live my life according to the songs we were singing this morning. What a wonderful, to do your will, to be surrendered to your will. I want your will to be done in me. The pathway to contentment starts with being Christ-centered and faith-based. Why? Why? Because almost every other part of our lives are out of our control. You realize that? By the strength of your will, decide you're going to take one more breath. <gasps> but the next one, and the next one, we don't force ourselves to take another breath or make our heart beat another few moments. All of those things are out of our control. Uh, we've got a whole pile of voting machines down here all lined up because there's going to be a, a polling place here and the people are going to come and vote. Do you know how much of what we vote for we actually control? You want to control the trade war? You want to control the world economy? You want to control the unemployment numbers? You want to control whether or not North Korea gains nuclear weapons superiority over some of its neighbors? Do you like to control Iran? How much of stuff that's going on in Washington would you like to control? You know something? You can't even control Overland Park. And Kansas is way beyond your power to do anything with. To be honest, most of the things in our lives 
are out of our control. And if we happen to be a type A person that wants to fix it all and put it back on its wheels, we're not going to end up with contentment. We're not going to be content. Because there's always something more to fix. Straighten out. It's only when we have understood that the only one who really is in control is our Lord and Savior. He had complete control during his three years of ministry just to show us he's got it handled today. For those who live by faith, we have to just simply breathe in a big, big deep sigh of relief. Oh, I'm so glad I don't have control over these things. And let him do his work. Paul realized that too. He couldn't control what the Caesar was going to do about his decision of whether Paul was going to live or die. Everything about his life was Christ-centered and faith-based. And then he could be content. But the second thing is it's people-focused. I want to read for you from the first chapter. Let me just flip back over here. People-focused. Reading from verse 20 of the chapter 1, I eagerly and expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that I will have sufficient courage. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to understand, our 2020 group is studying about how to live without fear and guilt, how to, how to face our fears and our guilt and live beyond that. So we're actually studying a lot of this same area in Philippians. And this not being ashamed, not being uh, sufficient courage, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet in what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. We are Christ-centered, faith-based, and people focused. It is better for you that I delay going to be with Jesus. <laughs> Doesn't that sound weird? All right. It is better for you because you have things yet that you need to be understanding. You need to be encouraged to do. And so I'm going to do what God's called me to do, even if it means putting off for a while what I really would like to do. Your needs are important to us. Christ-centered, faith-based, people-focused, need-driven. I'm going to read for you Ephesians 4. Let me just turn to that if I can. 4 and 14 to 16. And this is the need-based. You see, Paul was always looking for a need that he could find a way that God could reach in and fill a need. Remember how many different times he took offerings back to Jerusalem to try and help the Christians there? He kept working to try and find a need that if he could work a little together, he could put some of the healing ointment of God's resources where they were most needed. All right, here's what he said. Verse 14, and yet it was good for you to share in my troubles, moreover. As you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Okay? 
we need to realize that we are not given resources to use for our own service. Okay, now I've I got to say this carefully. Many churches preach that we are to ask God for resources to make life better for ourselves. Don't you realize that? I mean, isn't that what the abundant life really means? To be able to drive a newer car than we had before? To put tires on it when we need to? I mean, to have a roof over our heads? I mean, isn't that mean, doesn't that mean the abundant life? To have what we want? What we need? No. God puts resources into our hands so that we can share with those who have less and who have needs that can't be met by themselves. Paul recognized that he didn't have to have a mansion to live in. He was living in a house provided by the government, keeping him incarcerated. He was in prison in this house. He called himself in chains. He had nothing to benefit by doing this work, but he was trying to help those who had needs that they couldn't meet by themselves. And many times he was going around saying, look, I know you don't have a lot, but if you help, people who have even less can survive. That's what it means to be need-based. When we realize that we have been useful in helping someone else, that could not otherwise live. I'm sorry, we sometimes put it down to just money. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this anyway. I, I, was gonna not, I was not gonna mention it, but this week they put out a gigantic big fat report on the uh, Mass shooting in Las Vegas where 800 people were injured and a whole bunch died. You know what they kept reporting in the inside of that report? The man who did the shooting was heard to have repeated over and over and over again, God does not love me. God does not love us. God does not care about us. God doesn't like us. And if we are outside of God's love, why do I have to have compassion for anybody else? I might as well shoot through the windows and knock a bunch of people off. Listen, my friends, it's not money that he needed. He had plenty. It's not resources he needed. He had plenty of food. He had everything he needed. But when we see people who are in need, sometimes it's simply to say, yes, God does love you. Let me show you. The obituary for my niece came out this week. Screaming all over that obituary. 29 years old. God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. Need-based isn't just a loaf of bread or help with rent assistance or something. It's sometimes just putting your arms around someone who feels completely isolated. And when we have done that, when we have recognized the need and we have supplied it out of the resources that God has provided us, there is contentment. There is joy. We need to be Christ-focused, faith-based, people-centered, need-driven, and never satisfied. I'm going to read from Philippians 3 because we, we just really have to focus on, on never, ever being satisfied. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold 
of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Go down through the list again. Christ-centered, faith-based, people-focused, need-driven, and never satisfied. Now, how can we lose our contentment? <laughs> how does the church go from being really completely focused on what God has for us to be? We're trying to get ready for a new pastor. How do we get ready? We have to stay focused. The easiest way is to get our focus slightly off of Jesus Christ as the center. Christ-focused is the first step. You'll notice back there on the back board, if you go back and check, keeping Jesus Christ in the center of our target is the very first step in being a part of a faithful congregation ready to move forward in the grace of Jesus Christ. Christ-centered, faith-based. Do you know what's easy for us to do? We get so focused on doing things just one way that all of a sudden we think that any time that it doesn't quite come out like we're used to it being, that it's somehow worse than it was? Have you ever been in a worship service where you didn't know any of the songs? I mean, before this morning? Look, these guys are doing everything. These people are trying everything they can to bring you the good news of Jesus Christ in song. But sometimes we think, well, they didn't sing the old rugged cross this morning or amazing grace, and so I don't feel like I've worshipped. We get so narrowly focused into something that we like or enjoy, we get ourselves bottled into a narrow role. How many of you would like to do the great pumpkin again? That's one of the great stories of the Breakpoint Church. We, did, we do the break, great pumpkin. Oh, that's wonderful. We do the good, awesome Christmas. No, we're not going to do that again. I'll guarantee you the next pastor has no interest in doing great pumpkin. So, Vern, you don't have to climb up on the roof of the gazebo again. Okay? Why? Because if only the things that we've done before that we're familiar with are the only things that are worth doing, we will be frustrated. The world changes. The very same things that were so effective in growing churches 10 years ago don't work today for anything. We just have to let God lead us to the next stage, to the next step. We can lose our contentment when we feel like the only people we want in our fellowship are people just like us. We narrow our focus. We narrow the group of people that we decide we're going to love and take care of. And all of a sudden, uh, I had a church in Indiana. Just before I got there, they'd had a whole group of people came in that had a pretty specific society circle. All right, They all wore leather jackets. They had great big wallets that they stuck in their back pockets that attached to their belt on a chain, you know. Do you understand who I'm talking about? They didn't always have the prettiest things written on the back of their jackets either. But you know what? They were hungry to learn about Jesus. And the congregation said, the pastor has made a connection to these people. We don't want them in our fellowship. They're not like us. How contented do you think that church was? Uh, huh. They can't be contented when they haven't done what Jesus Christ called them to do. Reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. We can lose our contentment because we just decide we've done enough. We've done enough. We've gone as far as we can. We're not going to do any more. Let somebody else do it now for a while. And you know what? I guarantee you, 
Any person who comes up to that conclusion is not going to find contentment. <laughs> you know why? The only way to really help people learn how to swim is to get in the pool and paddle. The only way to show someone else how to get it done is to join in the ministry and pull and strain and push and haul. If you want to criticize somebody, it's real easy when you're sitting in your lazy boy saying, well, they should be doing some more discipleship. They ought to be teaching people how to live for Jesus Christ. They're not doing their job. Well, they're not doing their job. That includes you. Why aren't you in here? Why don't you grab a friend that you know needs to understand Jesus a little better and take him under your wing and make that person a better, stronger person because we're in this struggle together. And if we ever get satisfied, not only does that not do the job God has called us to do, but we lose the sense of contentment that we have accomplished. Remember, there was a red-headed preacher sleeping in a bed in the middle of a storm in Miami, Florida in 1992. How can you sleep through that? Because I had done everything I needed to do. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't nervous. I was Christ-centered, faith-based, people-focused, need-driven, and never satisfied till I didn't have to quit. The pathway to contentment is not easy. It's a very narrow path. And it's easy to get sidetracked because we do get distracted sometimes. But Paul, in writing to the Philippian church, said, I am going to give you the center of everything I have learned. I want you to have the core out of everything I have discovered about life and faith. It probably is the central book that tells about the most important truth that Paul ever has learned. I invite you to become a Philippians student, to become a, 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 a pupil of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church that he loved with all of his heart and wanted them to have every blessing that God had intended for them and there are all the parts are in there. How can you live with victory, with confidence, and with contentment? Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Dear Jesus, we have walked around this subject. We've looked at Philippians and we've kind of touched on some of the most important ideas that Paul wrote. But that doesn't really make us any more contented than we were when we came in here. Because in reality, it's what we carry out that's most important about our contentment. If we have committed ourselves more completely to the Lord Jesus Christ and His will, we'll be more contented. If we have captured enough faith that we can face another week of challenges, we'll find more contentment if we've looked across our lives and seen people that needed us, that just can't live another day without a word of encouragement or a loving hand, we'll be more contented. If we take this message and we apply it into our lives, contentment is in our future. But it's only as we grab it and claim it for ourselves. We ask, Lord, that you'll work in the heart of every person here. And your spirit will be pointing to certain things and in the heart of each one. And you'll kind of say, do you understand what I'm calling you to do, my friend? Do you understand what still needs to be put in line? 
so that we can do together this great thing of understanding the purpose and the calling of Jesus Christ in our world? We ask you, Lord, as we close this service in prayer, we ask you that you will work miracles in the lives of every person here. Reach down into our hearts and breathe your healing breath of life into cold, dark places in our hearts and give us a chance to see life as you had shown us how to do it. Give us a chance to be a part of that great kingdom where the word of Jesus Christ is praised throughout our entire world so that we can honor you and glorify your holy name. Amen.